Jo Hornby, welcome to the Great Big Book Club. How are you? Very well, thank you for having me. So, uh, where are you locked down? I am in the village of Kimbury in Berkshire, where we've lived for 27 years, and I've got 50% of my children with me, which is two, and my husband and my dog. And um, when we first moved out here 27 years ago, it was my husband's bright idea, and I was extremely reluctant. And it took me a very long time to settle, but I have to say, 27 years in, it's paid off this year that we're out here and that we've got garden and, you know, then there's no sort of, you know, in the village people just go for walks and so it's been absolutely fine really. I cannot complain. Kent, 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 Kentbury, where you are, yeah. plays a massive part in your new book, Miss Austin, about the life of Cassandra Austin, Jane Austen's older sister? Older sister by three years, yeah. Uh, two girls in, uh, and, si and six boys, so they were very, very close. Cassandra was the oldest by three years, and they stuck together like glue through all Jane's life. So could, can I just stop you for a second? Could you just tell me the idea and, the, uh, and a bit of the synopsis of the plot, just for those of us who haven't read it? Well, the thing about Cassandra, which makes her very, very unpopular with everybody who loves Jane Austen, is that she outlived Jane by 24 years. And towards the end of her life in the 1840s, she sat down with all the thousands of letters that they'd written to each other over Jane's lifetime. And she went through them all. And anything that was a bit interesting, a bit sensitive, a bit confidential, a uh, bit juicy, she burnt. So we have 160 letters um, of Jane's, 161 now. Um, we have none of Cassandra's replies. And of the letters that we've got left, what we can know about them is that the information in them, Cassandra didn't mind us knowing, you know. So there's a kind of mention of a sort of week long romance with a man, which people have made a huge palaver out of. Films have been made and all the rest of it. But the thing is, if it was at all of any imp uh, importance whatsoever, Cassandra wouldn't have let us know about it. So when I first read about this, I thought, now there's a plot for a novel, The Burning of Letters. Legacy management in the 19th century was a big deal because you could sweep up the traces of somebody's life quite easily because all there was was pen and paper. Whereas now we, sh we shed ourselves wherever we go and we meet too many people and there are too many bad anecdotes about us out there. So there's no way you can sanitize somebody's life. But Cassandra was a very efficient, very intelligent woman. She totally sanitized Jane's life. Um, what, what we have of Jane's biography is like driven snow. It's all very pure and, and there's no evidence of any trauma or mood or bad behavior or anything. So I always thought that that was a great idea for a novel, but I couldn't really get into it. And then I realized that I was actually sitting on my way in because when we moved here, um, we were told that there was an Austin connection. And it turned out it wasn't particularly a Jane Austen connection, although she came here plenty of times. It was a Cassandra connection. This was a vicarage and the vicar was best friends with the Austin parents. Um, who were also vicars, and they had four sons, and they sent all four sons to the Austin's rectory to be educated. So those kids grew up with the Austin kids. They were all very close. They grew up like a litter of puppies. Cassandra formed an especial attachment to Tom, who lived here, and they were engaged. So it was a perfect match, you know, best friends, kids getting engaged, all you ever wanted. And then tragedy intervened, and, and he died before they could marry and she remained a spinster all her life. She was plunged into mourning and so on. Um, so my novel is actually set in 1840, towards the end of Cassandra's life, here in my house, where um, lots of letters would have been written from Austin's, from Jane, from Cassandra, to the people who lived here. So she's coming here to get a hold of those as part of her cleanup operation. And then through those letters, they're a gateway to the past and we're able to reflect on Jane's life, Jane and Cassandra's life together. 
the bumps in the road that the two of them hit and how they made it through. Talk about talk about writing what you know. You're you're, you're writing where you're living. I mean, it must be such an extraordinary <laughs> revelation to realise that what you've been toying around with in your head was literally literally under your nose. Yeah, I feel a bit dim actually because it took me about twelve years to work out. <laughs> but um, when, but. I wrote two other contemporary novels. I didn't have the nerve to write this one because the thing about this one is Jane has to walk around and talk and think. And also I had to make up a load of her letters. So it felt a bit bold for a first novel. So I, had, I wrote a couple of contemporary ones and then I thought, right, now's the time. Very Have successful you? contemporary ones, by the way. The, you, the, your first book, The Hive, was, was a huge hit, uh, as was the second one altogether now. I mean, really extraordinary. So. So well, you were just sort of, cut, you thought you were going to cut your teeth on contemporary fiction before you went on to... Yeah, they were a bit like, I mean, I'm proud of them and I wouldn't prevent anyone from buying them, but um, I feel they were like training bar bras in a way, you know, it was, it was, I was getting used to the form of the novel and the length of the work. I'd never written anything that long before, you know, it's not like I had loads of manuscripts in my desk drawer. Um, that was my first and that was my second and those are the only two pieces of fiction I've ever read, written in my life. Um, so yes, it got me into the form and the length and, and gave me the confidence, I suppose. So then I went back to the official um, edition of the letters and in the introduction, I noticed for the first time, it said, of course, there would have been many, many other letters to family in Kent and friends in Berkshire but none of them have ever surfaced. And I thought, well, of course, there would have been millions here. Then I checked, and this family, the Fowles, lived in this house for 100 years. They were the vicar, the vicar, you know, it was the grandfather, then the father, then the son. So there was 100 years of one family here. And in 1840, when Cassandra was doing her cleaning up act and having her bonfire, was when the one remaining spinster daughter had to clear out the entire house after a hundred years of loads of people living in it. I mean, what a job. It's bad enough clearing out a flat. Um, so I thought, well, she can turn up then in the middle of it, find what she's looking for and do it that way. But it's, it's so exciting and so beautifully written. Uh, were you frightened of taking on the Austin fans and the Austin legacy? Because because yeah. in my experience, if you if you go for the sacred cows, do you know what I mean? It's uh, you can end up being burned. So how? I mean, was your research extensive? I mean, what did you do to? I think my research was pretty solid. The first thing that happened was 15 years ago. I was asked to write about the Jane for young children, for eight to 12 year olds, um, and to write a short it was for short books. And to write a short book, you have to know everything that you need to know to write a long book. You need to know what to what to leave out. Um, so I did kind of know it all, and then I went over and over it again. Um, the thing about Jainites, rather than Jain fans, but the people who really know their stuff, is they're an incredibly generous and nice community. Um, I got myself through it. I mean, I felt very, very nervous starting, and I was very keen to make it Cassandra's story, because there's been so much Jane, 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 and... I'd become rather obsessed with Cassandra myself. So I kept putting off Jane's entrance, you know, because I basically was always so terrified of doing it. Um, and then the only way I really got myself to write it was because I had the freedom of, I hadn't actually been commissioned to write this. Nobody actually cared whether I wrote it or not. So I said to myself, well, look, just have a go, see what it's like at the end of it and just, Put it in a drawer if it, nobody ever has to see it you know and that was very liberating because you know when you are commissioned you have to send a chunk and you have to send another chunk and while editors are amazing and helpful and brilliant and can see things you're missing they also say oh i hope that bit's going to come i hope we're going to see more of that character or they you know when it, it and you get very possessive about what's in your own head so, so it, it was a great freedom, actually. And the draft I sold, the second draft, is, is different. It's got more letters in it. But I was able to do it. And then the manuscript, um, various Jane Austen experts were nice enough to go through it 
one of whom is called Deirdre Le Fay, and she's really invented Jane Austen studies, and she's the most marvellous, marvellous woman, but not, not that user-friendly, I have to say. She's absolutely terrifying. So I sent it to her, and I got this very long email back about all my howlers. No, 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 they would not have bounced upon bed springs, for bed springs were not invented until 1872. Read the following article. Um, that kind of stuff. Heaven forfend, Caroline would never have addressed her aunt thus. So I was able to take out all of that. And then at the end of it, uh, what amazed me is she didn't mention that I had committed the sacrilege of inventing 16 letters in Jane Austen's voice. She didn't even mention that. So I thought, oh. All of which you've been praised for in such a massive way. Someone, some one of the uh, reviews that I read said they'd gone back through the letters trying to work out which are the ones Jane had written and which are the ones you had written. Which yeah. all, of, all of the letters are invented in, in my book, all of them. Amazing. Well, that was, that was kind of not hard in a way. Uh, it was just a sort of act of ventriloquism. It was harder to have Jane as a character, you know, moving around in her life and reacting to things. Also, also uh, with, with historical fiction, it's, it's uh, the question of you have to know so much and then your job is to take it away again. Yeah. Because, because otherwise you're just showing off that you, you know, they had a frilly hat or a... So I know. Everybody who has the same literary interests as me adores Georgette Heyer. I, she drives me nuts because they always get out the land out coach that have, has two horses and da, 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 and they never actually get to the doorstep. You know, you've got to get through. And I feel she really over it actually because there's, she knows too much. I mean, you can't know too much. You have to know it all. And then you just have to pretend you don't know any of it and that that's just normal times. You know, so, you know, you wouldn't, if writing a contemporary novel, when they go to put the kettle on, which they seem to do endlessly in my contemporary novels, you wouldn't explain how the kettle worked, but Georgia Hale would if she was right, you know. So I, I think that's important. It is also interesting. Um, I remember listening to the Hilary Mantel did a, a Reef lecture about, about writing historical fiction. And she said that one of the problems is that we have hindsight in that we know what's going to happen to these characters and so the problem is you have to keep them in their present which yeah. i always thought was a very interesting yeah. concept yes and that was with jane you know with jane austen we all know her as the woman who changed the face of the novel and one of the most much but her whole life she didn't know she was that person she absolutely didn't she was a struggling spinster she had Norpence, nobody wanted to marry her. She had eight years when she was shoved from pillar to post before she got into her cottage at the end and, and, then, and then died horribly young. And she didn't know that she was going to take off like this because she didn't have the success in her lifetime of say a Walter Scott. And, and she never met any of her readers or her publisher or another writer or anything. She didn't lead a literary life. You, you, you have been a, become a great cheerleader for Cassandra. And do you think uh, that sort of behind every successful woman uh, was another woman helping her out in this period in history? Because women themselves were essentially powerless chattels. Yes, I don't think just successful women. I think women who survived. It was extremely hard to find your way through in life if you didn't get married. And I keep reading the statistic and not believing it, but I read it over and over again, that in Jane's era, 30, only 30% 30 of women got married, which is astonishing because they just started all that mass emigration to Australia and the, and the, and the um, you know, there was a lot of naval life, huge naval life. We were at war for a hundred years and blah, blah, blah. And, and a woman like Jane who didn't, a marriage, because men had the pick, a marriage was a business arrangement. You know, they might fall in love with all sorts of people, but there would be, there would be a deal going on behind the scenes. With and the Austins didn't have any money to put on Jane at all. So she would, and she was only averagely good looking and she was also pretty spiky and saw through people and didn't hide the fact that she saw through people. And the 19th century pompous man didn't, 
necessarily find it attractive to have himself, you know, to have his nonsense sort of kind of penetrated like that. So I don't think she was ever going to meet anybody. And Cassandra not marrying, if Cassandra had married, I don't know quite what would have happened to Jane, but because Cassandra didn't marry, they were together and they had their mother and their brothers were obliged to give them a pittance. And then another friend of theirs, Martha, who had literally nothing, joined forces. And they had in Chawton what historians now call a spinster cluster. There were a lot after the First World War as well, where women couldn't afford to put a, a roof over their own heads, even after the First World War when they were working as teachers and nurses and things. It was better to have, take your pittance and put it together with everybody else's pittance. And then you could get a house and, and, and you might get some meat on a Sunday and things like that. And, and that's how they made it through. So the only way a single woman could, could make it through in life is if she was left a lot of money. Um, and there wasn't much of that about either, because unless you were, your parents didn't have sons, you weren't going to get very much. You also make a brilliant point in, uh, in Miss Austen, the idea that, uh, that, that Jane Austen didn't write about marriage at all. All her books stop at their proposal. And in Miss Austen, you talk about how marriage was incredibly dangerous. I mean, you know, if you weren't yeah. killed by your first child, you'd be certainly killed by your second or third. Or Absolutely, absolutely. And also, I mean, 19th century marriage and 18th century marriage really wasn't such a prize. I can see why so many women didn't bother. You did, you'd married somebody you didn't know. You know, you'd never been in the, se in the same room alone with them until the proposal. You would not have necessarily touched very much. Then when you, you were married, you were taken away from your own family's centre of operations to your husband's centre of operations. You would live near them. His sisters would become your sisters. His mother would become your mother. This didn't suit everybody, you know. And the sisters-in-law can be some of the most difficult people. And the people who, the women who married Jane's brothers were the bane of her life. Well, Mary Austen, you seem to Mary Austen, <laughs> Pitts. Um, so there, there was a lot to consider. There was a, and, and then, if you got married at 19, 17, which is when they did, that's 20 pregnancies ahead of you. One of them will get you. One of them will get you. And also, you know, half the kids wouldn't make it. And so that would be a nightmare. But if you sail through the first sort of four or something, you'd go on the eighth. Out of her sisters-in-law, one only had two children and one had one child. The rest all died on their eighth, their eleventh, their ninth. They went, you yeah. know. God, how desperately depressing, isn't it? Horrible. And leaving all of those motherless children. Yeah. Which, of course, is where spinster sisters come in. Because you've got, all this, got a nursery full of suddenly motherless children. Oh, yeah. Call for the spinster sister. And so did you, did you enjoy getting Jane on the page in, uh, in the end? Because I, I yes. read that you found it quite tricky to start off with. Yes. Once I got over the terror, actually, and... Um, and brought her in, I couldn't shut her up. No, it, it was great fun. I had this gift actually, because in one of the first letters she write, ever wrote to Cassandra, it was to our house here. Jane, um, Cassandra was here on her first Christmas away from her parents, staying with Tom before he went over seas. And, and Jane wrote her, Jane's only about 16 or 17. She says something to the effect of, I think I've got the hang of this letter writing lark. You just write as if the person you're talking to is sitting opposite you. And I thought, well, okay, I'll take your word for it. If that's how you say you talked to her, then, then I can model, I can ventriloquize that. And so um, it's, you know, the letters tell us very little apart from what the weather was like, what they had for dinner, but it does tell us a lot about their relationship and how they talked to one another and, and their jokes they shared. And the incredible dependence, especially dependence of Jane upon Cassandra, um, that's in there. Um, it's extraordinary that Cassandra burns all those letters. Um, do, do you think she was like this of the original curator of fake news? The idea that, that our impression of Jane is entirely wrong? Do you think she was... Well, I don't think it's entirely wrong. I think it's very, very cleansed. And I think it's a huge part of Jane's success because you never, 
you know, you read and read the novels and you never come across that block of thinking, of knowing that the person whose novels you adore is a bit of a dodgy human being. Like the Dickens, you know, more and more stuff comes out about how he treated his women and his wives and his kids and all the rest of it. And, and although he was adored in his lifetime, we do not adore him in the same way. Jane, we can adore because there is simply no sin or crime has ever been been attributed to her. So it was a work of genius, it's a work of genius, really. I mean, that she created the person that we've got today. And so she is universally loved, even though if she was alive today and she was going on the one show or, 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 or start the week, she'd say something that would piss everybody off and get her in the Daily Mail because she, that was what she was like. But, um, you know, but, but we don't have that. We have this. We have this saintly figure. Julie Andrews type figure, isn't she? Yeah. She's brilliant. So obviously you love her. Um, are you gonna, what are you gonna do with her? I mean, is she, she must be tapping you on the shoulder saying, what's next? Um, well, I'm not sure she's personally requested it, but the editor, my editor has. And so yes, I am doing more. You know, I love, writing about family and I love reading about family and I actually don't think there's anything else as interesting as family. Uh, it is the most perfect theatre of, for, for examining humanity and the Austins are a cracking family. They had, they were incredible. They were amazing, extraordinary lives, extraordinary personalities. And so I am doing something else along the same lines, yeah. Um, but from the perspective of someone else, the family. Not Mary. God, no. I wouldn't want to read a novel about Mary. <laughs> Poor old Mary with her pockmarked skin. I mean, that's what, that's, she's almost, it's almost in parenthesis, isn't it? Yeah. Pockmarked skin. Um, well, listen, good luck, Jill. That was amazing. Love, really lovely to talk to you. Uh, do you know what the title is going to be for the next one? I'm not going to say because it, it might change. Okay, okay. Well, listen, good luck. I've got to write the bloody thing, which I have done. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely brilliant, and you're a superstar. Thank you so much. Thank you.